Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Um, sorry. Uh, let me know when you want to start. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I'm Maria. I'm going to be hosting the the um, event today. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. We've had a lot of interest in this event, and thanks Jessica for coming to speak with us today. Um, so this is our sixth event of term, I think. And Jessica is going to be giving us an introduction to quantum computing. Uh, Jessica Pointing is a PhD student here at the University of Oxford and was previously uh, doing a PhD at Stanford and has also been at Harvard and MIT for undergraduate and um, has also started various quantum computing associations of her own and started Stanford Quantum Computing Association and Harvard Quantum Computing Asso Association. And Jessica has also um, been invited to various to give various talks about quantum computing, including at IBM Q conferences and the Oracle Code One conference. It has also won um, a prize in the first IBM Q quantum computing hackathon. So we're really excited to hear what you've got to say about quantum computing. Um, yeah, and please feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thank you. I will start once I get this set up. Okay, great. Do you see me? Yeah, we can see you well. Yeah. Okay, great. Is this on full screen or maybe I need to do that? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, full screen. Okay, great. So, um, can you hear me? It doesn't show that it's talking. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you fine and see everything fine. Oh, okay. Sorry, my Zoom's being weird. It's not showing. Up. I'll just do this, don't worry. Okay. Hello, <laughs> uh, quantum computing. So about 10 years ago, when I was a young girl in middle school, I was invited to this technology workshop. And I remember walking into this room and there was a really cool setup. And there was a guy called Chris Bishop. And he was giving a talk on computers of the future. He was talking about futuristic ideas for new kinds of computers. And one of them was quantum computing. And then he showed us something that I'd never seen before. It was of a superconductor uh, levitating on top of the magnetic track. So 10 years later, I was so fascinated with this experiment that I bought it myself. And I want to show you a video of it. Um, so hopefully you can all see my screen. So as you can see here, this is a superconductor and it's levitating on top of a magnetic track. And the cool thing is we can even make it hover underneath the magnetic track as well. So this is a uh, video I took about a few months ago when I, I bought this uh, cool experiment. So when I saw this, I was pretty amazed. And the reason that this occurs is because of quantum physics. So quantum physics describes how the world works at the most fundamental level, the level of atoms and subatomic particles, such as electrons. And a quantum computer is a new species of a computer that uses the amazing behavior of quantum physics in order to solve some computational problems significantly faster. So, 10 years ago, this quantum computer was a computer of the future. But one thing I hope to show you in this talk today is that actually it's no longer a computer of the future. A quantum computer is a computer of today because quantum computers do exist. And this is why it's such an exciting time to get involved in quantum computing because we have real quantum devices. So anyone basically who has internet access can actually program a quantum computer. And I'll show you how you can do this later on in the talk. And today we're going to be looking at the three P's of quantum computing. One, the potential. What can we actually do with a quantum computer? Why is there so much excitement around this field? Two is the power. How can we, uh, how does a quantum computer actually work? What gives it the power to be able to solve some problems faster? And third of all, the progress. 
how much progress have we made so far and what is left to do in the field? So let's start off with potential. So I'm going to look at some specific applications. The first one is called factoring. Let's say I give your computer the number 15 and I say now multiply two numbers you must multiply. What are the two numbers you must multiply to give 15? Well, that's extremely easy. Your computer knows that five and three multiply to give 15. That's no problem at all, of course. But what happens if I give it this 617 digit number? And now I say, find me the two numbers. Well, that's extremely difficult. Your computer, in fact, would not be able to solve this problem. It is estimated it will take up to 1 billion years using the best known algorithms just to find out what those two numbers are on a classical computer. And when I say a classical computer, I am referring to a normal computer that's basically not a quantum computer, just to define the, uh, the terminology. So on a classical computer, just to find those two numbers, it would take up to a, a billion years. But how long do you think it could take on a quantum computer? And this isn't a rhetorical question. I actually want to find out. So I have a poll and have to grab the poll. Uh, ah, <laughs> I, I don't have the poll quite yet. Sorry, <laughs> uh, let me grab the poll. So um, what I'm going to ask you to do is go to pollev.com forward slash quantum 225 and you can put in your response to this question. So I'm going to share my screen. So if you could go to this link Let's take a look if some people have responded. So uh, to clarify, go to pollev.com forward slash quantum 225, and then you can put in your response. It's a bit hard on Zoom to see whether people are actually doing this. In real life, I can kind of see people actually bringing out their phones, but um, I'll assume some of you have done it by now. So let's take a look at some responses. Oh, okay. Uh, so. Okay, great. So we, ha we do have people responding. Um, yeah, so as we can see, you guys are very optimistic around 100 seconds down to the picoseconds. Um, okay, some of you are a bit pessimistic now, but uh, okay, great. So the correct answer is it's actually 100 seconds. So we could do this in just 100 seconds on a quantum computer. And now we go back. So on a quantum computer. So as you can see, that's a huge difference from a billion years all the way down to 100 seconds to solve those two numbers. Now you might think, okay, that's not an interesting problem finding two numbers, but if you're familiar with, um, with encryption, you'll know this is an important problem. So how do we know this is possible? Well, that's because people come up with quantum algorithms. And a quantum algorithm is a set of instructions that you give to a quantum computer. So there is a guy called Peter Shaw, and he's actually a professor at MIT, and he came up with this algorithm and showed theoretically a quantum computer could do this. And it's a very important problem because this is actually what keeps all your data secure on the internet, your credit card, your bank information. And essentially with a quantum computer, you have the key to unlock this um, encryption method. So that is a problem, but do you need to worry that the internet is going to collapse tomorrow? Well, no, because we actually haven't built a quantum device that is powerful enough to find those two numbers. However, it's really an important problem to think about because if it takes us, let's say, you know, a decade to build this quantum computer, then people estimate it could take actually up to a decade just to replace uh, our, our encryption methods for all the data that there is um, on the internet and elsewhere. So as you can see, this um, is an important problem to think about. And there is a field called post quantum cryptography, uh, where people are actually trying to develop new methods that could be safe against a quantum computer. So another problem uh, we can look at is called unstructured search. So let's assume that I have a bag with 100 balls. And let's say that each ball is numbered from one to 100. And if I just go into the bag and pick up a ball at random, how long will it take to get to a ball, the ball number three? Well, classically, it would take up to 100 tries because you have 100 balls and there's completely no structure to it. So you can't really use um, something else. But what about a quantum computer? Well, actually, it could take just eight tries 
even though there's completely no structure. So let's say if you had a database of n entries, classically, uh, if you do computer science, you know, yeah, it would take up to n tries because you just have to go through it one by one. But on a quantum computer, you could do it in up to square root of n tries. So that's another specific example. And again, this is, we know this is possible because of a quantum algorithm. And this quantum algorithm is called Grover's algorithm. And later in this talk, we'll see, uh, sorry, later in this talk, we'll actually see how you can implement Grover's algorithm on a real quantum computer. So that's one look at specific quantum algorithms that have been designed. But let's take a look at some broader uh, places where quantum computing can be applied. So one is understanding nature. So everything around us is made up of atoms and molecules, as you know. So, and it all follows the laws of quantum physics. So therefore, we could use a quantum system, a quantum computer, to simulate a quantum system, which nature is. And this could have a whole variety of applications. For example, in medicine, you want to design new drugs that could interact with the molecules in your body. So we could potentially simulate these molecules more efficiently and design new types of medicine. Or how about material science? We could potentially uh, design new types of materials that could be used on your laptop, on your phone to build better technology. So that's uh, one of the, actually the most uh, exciting applications because it would actually allow us to tap into nature, understand how nature works and use that to harness and to create new technology. So a third one is machine learning. Um, you can never really not mention AI and machine learning these days, but there is a whole field called quantum machine learning. And it may sound just like a lot of buzzwords, but it does actually kind of make sense if you look at the underlying mathematics because quantum computing deals with linear algebra and Machine learning also deals with linear algebra like vectors, matrices, and you'll see a little bit of this later on. So you can actually map the two together, and a lot of people are working on this. So here are three potential applications for quantum computing. Now you're probably thinking, okay, but how does this actually work, and how do we, uh, how do we, uh, how are we able to actually solve these problems faster? So just to recap, there's a whole a range of industries from AI to medicine to materials, space, logistics, finance. And this is why people are excited about quantum computing because the algorithms are kind of broad enough that they could be applied to all of these industries. So you could solve the unsolved problems. Something that's practically impossible to solve on a normal computer could be solved in just seconds on a quantum computer. All right, so let's actually look at the power behind it and why it is able to do this. So first of all, we need to understand the quantum bit. So if you're familiar with computer science, you know that you have uh, everything is stored and processed as bits. So any character can be represented as a sequence of bits. And this is the underlying basis for how our computers work. So let's say I have a classical bit. I'm going to use a donut to illustrate this. So let's say the one is the frosted side and zero is the plain side. So this is the classical bit, and it can only be zero or one. Well, what about a quantum bit, also known as a qubit? A qubit can also be zero, and it actually can also be one. But there's something special about the qubit in that it can be a superposition of zero and one. I think of it like a spinning donut. Uh, when it's in superposition, you think, well, it's a combination of zero and one. It's not one or the other. So um, now when I've given this talk in the past, people wanna take a look into actually the mathematics behind, uh, behind the qubit. So I'm, I'm going to show a little bit of the maths, but I just wanna see like what type of audience uh, we have here. So if you could go to this Polev uh, again, go to polev.com forward slash quantum 225 and just put in your answer whether you know linear algebra uh, like matrices, multiplying matrices, vectors. If you don't know it, that's completely fine at all. You can actually understand this whole presentation without knowing um, the maths. But if you want a deeper understanding, uh, it could help to do that. So I'm going to share uh, the results and all results are anonymous, but um, yeah. Uh, that is not what I wanted. Oh, here it is. <laughs> um, Let's go to the next one. Yes. Do you know linear algebra? Uh, yes, 100%. Oh, wow, that's great. Okay. <laughs> I, will, I will spend uh, some time explaining it. 
Um, okay, great. And where am I? I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so to look a little bit into the maths of it, um, so we have this qubit, it's zero. And what does this look like mathematically? Well, it's actually just a vector. So as you can see, it's equivalent to this vector one, zero. And actually the one state, let's call it, is the vector uh, zero, one, as you can see here. So this gives you a little bit of understanding as actually you can just represent qubits as vectors. Right, so now we have uh, the superposition. So what is the superposition doing? Well, essentially, actually, you are adding together these two vectors. So we're adding together the one zero and the zero one. And then we end up getting one one. But if you are familiar with qubits, you know that this is incorrect because we actually do need to normalize the vector. So this here, this one over square root of two is a normalization term and um, yeah, this actually has more significance, which you'll see later also in the talk. Right, so why is superposition powerful? Let's just take a look at a little, um, little thought experiment. Is like, let's say you open up a box, a donut box, and inside there are two donuts. If it's a classical box, you would either see one particular state. You'd either see zero, zero, or you'd see zero, one, or you'd see one, zero, or you'd see one, one. And you can think of uh, a quantum computer, uh, sorry, a classical computer working in a similar way. It can only see one particular state or combination of states um, at a particular time. But now if we open up the box and it's a quantum bit, uh, these are actually spinning inside. And so I ask you, what combinations do you see? You'd actually see all of them um, at the same time. So now I have another poll for you, another question is, um, how many combinations do you think there would be if you had 300 qubits in superposition? So I'm going to share that again. All right, let's take a look at what you guys think. Okay, um, 10 to the power of 90, a million, a billion. Uh, okay, great, so uh, there's some variance, but um, most of you are correct. The answer is 10 to the power of 90, so great. Uh, let's go back. Yes, and uh, the reason why is because anytime you have N qubits, you can actually represent two to the power of n combinations or bits. So in this case, we had 300 qubits, that would be two to the power of 300, which is roughly 10 to the power of 90. So as you can see, superposition is very powerful. So now that we have superposition, you might be wondering, well, how do we actually control these qubits? How do we compute with them? Well, we can use something called quantum gates. If you're familiar with um, classical computers, again, we have something called logic gates. So let's say we have the bit zero, we put it through the logic gate not, um, and then we end up with one. So this is essentially how you build a computer. You have these logic gates, then you have basic modules, then you have circuit chips, um, and then you build the computer. So it's similar in quantum computing. We have something called quantum gates. So let's take a look at an example. One quantum gate is called the X gate or the bit flip gate. So if we have our qubit, it's zero, we can put it through the gate and it ends up flipping it to one. So you can take a look here. This is the sequence of steps. So this is classical because it's not really doing anything quantum, but it is a quantum gate. Um, so let's take a look at more interesting gate. Oh, oh yes, the deeper understanding. <laughs> if you want to understand what is going on behind it, these gates. Uh, actually, so basically a gate can be represented as a matrix. So as you can see, this X gate is represented as this matrix here. And then what you do is you actually multiply the matrix by the input vector, which is the qubit. So the state that the qubit's in at the beginning. And then when you multiply them out, you end up getting the output vector. So if you see, this is actually the output, um, the output uh, one. So let's take a look at another gate. So this is called the superposition gate. 
So let's say I have my qubit, it's zero. If I put it through the superposition gate, it then basically ends up spinning. So we put it into superposition. So let's take a look at here. So um, you can't really see this well in the, the picture, but it's, it's spinning, it's at um, a slight angle. So uh, the matrix here again is similar, but it's a little bit more complicated than the bit flip gate. Um, we have this Hadamard gate matrix. And then again, we do the same thing. We multiply it by the input vector, and then we actually end up getting the output vector, which is the superposition, uh, the, the qubit in the superposition state. So now I have a question for you. What would happen if you put a superposition qubit or a qubit in superposition state into the Hadamard gate? What would the output be? So you could either guess or you could actually do the maths if you want to by multiplying the matrix by the input matrix. Um, and I'm going to show it in the, the poll here. So if you go to polev.com forward slash quantum 225, um, you can go there. All right, so what happens if you put a qubit in superposition through the Hadamard gate? Oh, okay, great. I got you guys in this one. <laughs> you guys are great on the other ones. Um, okay, well, uh, so yeah, there's a, a lot more uh, variance here, but um, okay, great. So we have that. So let's take a look at the correct answer. So it's actually the zero state. So let's go back to our presentation and Right, so if we put it in superposition and we put it through the Hadamard gate, it ends up being in the zero state. So as you can see, the gate doesn't do just, it, it works on the input that you give it. It doesn't um, just like do one fixed thing. It depends on the input. Um, and again, here is the deep understanding. You just multiply out the two matrices and then you end up getting that. So remember that our qubit, so remember that our computer is actually, um, we only understand classical bits. <laughs> so if we want to compute something and we want the output three, let's say, it has to be a classical sequence of bits. We can't really return it as a quantum sequence of bits. So that means that we actually do something called a measurement. So when um, we have this qubit, it's in superposition. You can think of it like, let's say if I made, if I just dropped this donut, um, it would actually fall on the table or whatever surface with 50% probability on its frosted side and 50% probability on its plane side, assuming uh, equal weight on both sides. And this actually affects the measurement of the qubit. So when we measure it, it actually ends up collapsing to a particular bit. So either the zero or one, and there's a probability assigned to that. So, um, 50% of the time it could be one uh, or 50% of the time zero. So to understand the deeper understanding, remember that we have our superposition qubit as one over square root of two, one over square root of two. Well, actually, if you take that number in the vector um, and you square it, you actually end up getting the probability. So one over square root of two squared equals one half. So that's 50%. So you'd actually end up having the 50% one, 50% zero. Now you might think, well, wait a second, if it's 50%, it's just random. And then this is just a random computer. This isn't actually doing anything, but you can actually change the probabilities. So for example, here we have 75% and 25%. So you can actually change the numbers. Um, and again, yeah, if you square that number and that, that number is called the amplitude. So if you square that uh, amplitude, you get the probability of it collapsing to one or zero. And so this is actually how we basically compute in quantum computing is that we are basically manipulating the probability of getting a particular state or outcome at the end when you measure it. And your goal with the algorithm is to increase the probability of getting the correct outcome, the correct combination of bits, the correct state, um, and actually decrease the probability of getting the wrong outcome, the wrong combination of bits. 
So this is the measurement. This is what it looks like when we um, program it on a quantum computer. Um, so as you can see, you can put something in superposition in the measurement and it will either come out as zero or one in the case of a single qubit. So right, so we took a look at the quantum bit and quantum gates. And now we're going to take a look at how do you actually program a quantum computer? So these are the fundamentals to actually program, uh, program it. So in order to understand programming, we have to basically put sequence of gates together. And when we do this, this is called a quantum circuit. So here is probably one of the simplest quantum circuits you can see is we have a Hadamard gate and a measurement. So if our qubit is zero, it would go through the Hadamard gate. It would, be, it would end up spinning and then we'd end up measuring it. But remember that I said, when you measure it, it's like 50% of the time it could be one or zero or, or any other probability that you want. So because of that, we actually have to run it a thousand times um, or any other number of times in order to actually understand what the probabilities are, right? Because if you just run, run it once, you, you, you wouldn't know, you'd only get one or zero. But if we run it a thousand times, then we'd see, oh, 500 times it gives me one and 500 times it gives me zero. So that means that this qubit is in superposition of zero and one. So I want to show you how to actually do this on a quantum computer. Um, so uh, as you can see here, this is called the IBM Q experience. So I would recommend after this talk, uh, Google IBM Q experience and create an account, it's free. And you can actually just do what I showed you is you can drag and drop gates and actually run them on a real quantum computer. So this is what the interface looks like. I think this is one of the old interfaces. So um, if you see something different, but it's very similar. As you can see, there are five lines. So that means that we have five qubits here. Uh, so you know the, the, the top line is the first qubit, second line is the second qubit, et cetera. And then what you can do is you can actually drag and drop the gates onto, onto, these, uh, onto these lines, and then you can actually run it. So let's take a look at the video. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, let's take a look at the video um, here. Uh, sorry, my bad. Uh, uh, videos. All right, so as you can see here, we have the Hadamard gate and we dropped it onto the first line and then we drop the measurement and then we click run. And in this case, I'm just getting a result from the cache, but you can actually get this, uh, you can actually run this on the real quantum device. You can run it on any backend that you, uh, that is accessible to you. And as you can see, it gives us these two, uh, bar, uh, these two uh, probabilities. So it, I think this ran it 1,024 times. So as we can see, we have um, about 50, 2% of the time it's zero and about 48% of the time it's one. Um, yeah, so this actually means that this quantum computer is actually demonstrating superposition because otherwise you wouldn't be able to get such uh, probabilities. And then I want to show you another video, sorry, I should have, um, which is actually how you program this. Um, okay, <laughs> it's, here we go. So um, if you're familiar with Python, you can actually program this with Python. Uh, so this isn't supposed to be like an in-depth programming tutorial, but this is just to give you a flavor of what it's like to program on a quantum computer. So as you can see, we're just importing, this is called IBM Quizkit. So this is an API that you can use. And again, it's free open source, so you can use it. Um, then as you can see, we just literally, uh, literally just like say, let's create the uh, register. Uh, so those lines that you saw uh, are the registers. So here we're just creating um, one qubit, uh, one quantum and classical register. And then we can apply the Hadamard gate. So it's represented as H. And then we apply it to the qubit zero. We then do the measurement and we can even draw a little version of the circuit. And then you can execute it on a back end of your choosing. So in this case, uh, executing it on the simulator. And then it re returns the number of times that it returns zero or one. 
So yeah. So um, as a PhD student here at Oxford doing quantum computing, uh, this is a lot of what I do is quantum programming. So actually, um, so I, I use IBM Quizkit and um, obviously run more uh, complicated programs, but we actually just code it up in Python and run it on the quantum computer that is there for us. So that's how, how you execute the quantum algorithm is with the quantum gates. So actually, let's take a look at a specific quantum algorithm and what that would look like in terms of gates. So let's go back to the example where we had a bag with 100 balls. But in this case, let's simplify it to four balls. So this is the algorithm called Grover's search. Let's say I want to find the ball number three. Well, classically, it would take up to four tries. And in the quantum case, it would take just one try. So as you can see here, we need to convert the numbers to bits. So we have um, the bit three is, uh, the number three is the bit one one. And that's actually what we want the outcome of the quantum circuit to return. So that means we only need two qubits in this case. And as you can see, we have these two qubits, and this is what the quantum circuit looks like. Um, so as you can see, you're already familiar with most of the gates here. We have the Hadamard gate, the blue gate, and the X gate, the green gate. And then we have the measurement at the end. And you may notice there's like this kind of line between the two qubits. And this is actually called the, uh, it's called the C naught gate, but you can also call it the entangling gate. So it entangles the two qubits together so they're connected um, in a quantum way, of course. Uh, so as you can see here, we have usually in a quantum algorithm, you usually start in superposition, not all the case, but in this case, we're starting in superposition. So that means we can process on multiple of the bits simultaneously. And then, um, so we're basically processing in all those, um, all those uh, four combinations. And then this is the main part of the algorithm, which um, has been designed by uh, the Professor Grover. And then at the end, you have the measurement at the end. So you can actually run that on the real quantum computer and um, uh, get the results of the, of the algorithm. So you might be thinking, OK, but how exactly like, do you use these quantum effects? So the idea is that we want to use the quantum effects in special ways to solve problems in new ways leading to better results. And I have a little uh, uh, strategy or a little game to show you how this works. So let's say you go to a classical donut shop and at the donut shop, there is a baker and he wants to play a game with you. And the game is uh, as follows. He has access to we're in the classical case. So he has access to two classical gates. These are the ones in yellow. And on these gates, they're customizable. So they have buttons. So either you can um, flip the bit or you can do nothing to it. Now you also have a gate. Um, yours is the red gate in the middle. And you can also choose to flip the bit or you can do nothing. So let's take a look. little example uh, is like if you have the bit zero, Let's say the baker decides to flip it, it would be one. And then you decide to uh, flip it again, it would be zero. And then the baker decides to flip it, it would be one. So um, if, if the bit ends up being zero, the baker wins. But if the bit ends up being one, you win. So now the question is, what percentage of the time would you win if you had the right strategy? Well, actually, it would be 50-50. It's um, random because you're just flipping uh, the bits. But now, let's say that the baker at the donut shop is quantum. <laughs> so now we're going to a quantum donut shop. And the baker has access to essentially a quantum computer, but you don't. Um, so now they want to play this game with you. Would you want to play this game? Uh, the answer is no, you wouldn't, because actually the baker would want, would win 100% of the time now that he has access to a quantum computer. And as you can see here, we have now the yellow gates, um, sorry, the, the yellow gates are now quantum gates. And now the baker has access to the Hadamard gate, which remember puts our bit into superposition or reverses the superposition. But you don't have, you're just on a classical computer, so you don't have access to that. 
So now I do have a question for you is what gates does, uh, does the baker use in order to win the game 100% of the time? And I'm going to go, oops, share my screen again. <laughs> Sorry, I just had a lot of, okay. Yes, so what quantum gates are used by the baker to win 100% of the time? Um, so yeah, remember the X gate is the bit flip gate and the Hadamard gate is the superposition gate. Um, I'll give you guys a few seconds to answer. Okay, great. Um, okay, interesting. Oh, wow. Some other answers are increasing. Oh, will it take over the second choice? Oh, no. Okay. Ah, all right. <laughs> now that, that is the output because now it's full. Um, so yes, you guys are correct. Uh, the baker would use the Hadamard Hadamard gate. So let's take a look at why. So remember that our bit starts in zero and the baker has access to uh, flip Hadamard or nothing. So let's say now the baker decides to use the Hadamard. So now it's in superposition. So now it's your turn. And um, so you could flip it, but what happens if you flip something that's spinning? Flip, it's still spinning. So basically flipping it doesn't change the superposition that it's in, or you could do nothing. So that means it's still in superposition. And now the baker has the chance to do something. So they use the Hadamard gate and remember that when it's spinning, it then, oh, it was instant superposition, it then actually collapses to zero if you put it again through the Hadamard gate. So that means that the baker always wins if they have the right strategy 100% of the time. Now you might be thinking, well, wait a second, that's unfair because the baker has access to like something different and you don't. Well, actually that's the whole point is that you're the classical computer, the baker is the quantum computer. So on the quantum computer, we have access to these new gates like the Hadamard gate um, and the entangling gate. And that's why we have to think of creative ways to use these new types of quantum gates to solve problems uh, a lot better than the classical computer. And if you think, oh, this is a silly example, well, there's actually a paper on it. So, um, and it's called Quantum Strategies and they demonstrate this problem, not with, I don't think it's with the baker and all that. So <laughs> I added that into it. But, um, and there is also another paper called Quantum Algorithms and Quantum Games that actually connects how these quantum strategies are actually similar to how quantum algorithms work. So that gives you a little taster into why a quantum computer can do something a little bit better than a classical computer. Right, so here we've looked at the power and we spent uh, the bulk of the time on that, but now we're going to look at the progress. So we've seen like what you could do with a quantum computer, source of how it works, and now we can look at, um, you know, where, where are we actually and what is left to do? Um, so the progress, first of all, there's the hardware, which is probably the most important part of the progress is actually how do we build a quantum computer? So there's actually um, different ways to build a quantum computer. So if you look at our classical computers, um, as you may know, they're made up of transistors, which are the building blocks uh, for our classical computers. But it actually didn't used to always be that way. People used to use vacuum tubes in the past, but it turned out that transistors were a lot more reliable, a lot cheaper, more efficient. And that's why we use them today. And obviously that took off. Um, but I would say that just as there were like different ways to build a computer in the past, there are different ways to build a quantum computer right now, but we're in the stage of, we're not really sure what the equivalent of the transistor is. We haven't really had that kind of winner one yet. And it could be one of the existing ones or it could be something completely new. So for example, if you remember at the beginning of the talk, um, I showed you this video of the superconductor levitating. So actually one of the most popular ways to build a quantum computer is with superconductors. I should note they're not levitating in the, superconductor, uh, in the quantum computer, but the substrate is, uh, is the same as superconductor. And actually IBM and Google, um, a lot of companies are working on this. So this is one of the most popular ways. Another way is trapped ions. So these are atoms with a net electric charge confined into a particular space. Um, Another one is photons, which is basically light. 
And another way is actually diamonds. I have a friend who's working on diamond quantum computing at Stanford and he's like, yeah, if you ever want some diamonds, just let me know. And I was like, yes, that sounds great. <laughs> so as you can see, there's a lot of different ways to build a quantum computer. And really the goal is to find uh, a way that would help us to build a quantum computer much more faster and, and cheaper and more efficiently. Um, so you're probably thinking, well, why can't we just build a quantum computer with hundreds of millions of qubits? Uh, what's the problem? Well, so uh, if we go back to the analogy of the spinning donut, if this is a spinning, eventually it actually stops spinning. Um, and you can think of it, it's the same as a qubit. If it's in superposition, it eventually loses its superposition and actually kind of becomes a classical bit. So that's a huge um, problem is because uh, we need to maintain the quantum effects in order to use the quantum computer for long computations. Um, but it's a really hard problem to be able to actually control these qubits and to be able to keep up this, uh, the quantum effects because essentially you're working with like atoms and electrons. So it's very, very fragile. Um, but despite that, we've actually been able to build a quantum computer. So here's a little picture of the IBM quantum computing lab. And I walked into a couple of quantum computing labs and it's kind of like you're in the past and the future at the same time. Uh, because, you know, in the past, um, you see those pictures of computers taking up a whole room. And it's very similar in that sense that you walk in and it's completely a whole room full of equipment just to control uh, the quantum computer. But obviously it feels like the future because it's very different. Uh, even the look of the, the computer is very different than um, what we typically have now. So as you can see, some people call this like a chandelier. So um, this is the superconducting uh, quantum computer. So this architecture, different uh, substrates like the trapped ions, photons have different types of architecture, but this is a superconducting one. And actually the quantum chip itself is like very small. It's only, it's only like this, this smaller than a coin at the bottom of this chandelier looking thing. Um, but all of this equipment around it is just to control the qubits and just to be able to um, manipulate and control them for computation. And to give you an idea of how difficult this is, I recently attended a presentation um, by Google and I asked them if I could borrow this slide. So as you can see, we have this graph here and uh, one dot equals one physics experiment. And, and this is just to control two qubits. And this was the guy's PhD who presented on it. So as you can see, it was just these two dots. And as a PhD student, I don't know if I'm encouraged or discouraged by that, but as you can see, it's super complicated to actually build this. And I'm more on the software, not the hardware. So um, I don't even know how complex it is, but um, uh, it, it's really an engineering feat to actually build these systems. So next, let's take a look at another milestone in the field, which is quantum supremacy. And you may have heard about this in the news uh, about a year ago. Um, but basically, this was sort of a race between the world's best supercomputer um, and a quantum computer. And the reason that this experiment was done was because before this point in time, um, basically anything you could do on a quantum computer, you could do on a supercomputer. So a quantum computer couldn't actually beat a classical computer. Um, so it was kind of, you know, what's the point of the quantum computer? So uh, Google designed this experiment to say, okay, let's look at one problem and let's show that the quantum computer can be a lot faster than the supercomputer. So they did that. And um, apparently this problem took 200 seconds on the quantum computer and they estimated it would take about 10,000 years on a supercomputer. So as you can see, that is quite um, a big achievement. And the only problem is the, the problem itself isn't so useful. Um, people are still trying to find applications of the problem, but it, it was still a pretty big milestone for the, the, for the field. So this is the current state. Uh, this um, experiment was done with 53 qubits and we can solve one problem faster on a quantum computer. Uh, that's the quantum supremacy experiment. And I would say the ultimate goal is to get to something called a uh, large scale quantum computer. So this is a quantum computer with millions of qubits, because if you have millions of qubits, you could obviously solve a lot, um, lot more problems um, and uh, hopefully be able to um, solve problems faster on the quantum computer than the world's best supercomputer. So as you can see, there's a bit of a gap. 
um, between that, and this is like the quantum bridge in a sense, but there is opportunity here because, you know, gradually, maybe we could just gradually find more and more problems, even though we don't have a quantum computer with millions of qubits, maybe with hundreds of qubits, we could still do something useful. And this is really where I would say the opportunity lies for those people who want to get involved in, in quantum computing is because you can think of, okay, what can we do on a quantum computer? Let's try and find some applications with the current devices we have today. And that's where the opportunity lies. Um, and that's why I think we need to develop the next developers for quantum computing, because they're the ones who are going to be able to design the quantum algorithms or program the quantum computer to solve a particular problem. And the great thing is that anyone has access to the quantum hardware. As I showed you earlier on in this talk, anyone can access the IBM Q experience. Um, and that means anyone can essentially program on a quantum computer. Uh, so there's a big opportunity here. And there's also an opportunity in terms of there's a lot of companies working on this. So there's a large company such as IBM, Google, Microsoft. Uh, obviously there's universities such as Oxford, MIT. Um, and <laughs> we also have startups um, such as Rigetti, QCWare, INQ, Zapata, PsyQ. Um, they have really cool names. Uh, so there's a lot of people working on quantum computing. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities and it just keeps growing. So this is an overview of what we've talked about. Um, as you can see, we've talked about the potential of particular applications, factoring search, understanding nature, uh, machine learning. We've talked about the power of quantum computer computers, the quantum bit, uh, the quantum gates, and uh, quantum programming. And then we've also talked about the hardware, quantum supremacy, and the opportunities that lie ahead. I would say there are two future states of the universe, one without a large scale quantum computer, that's the one with millions of qubits, and one with a large scale quantum computer. Right now, right now, we don't really know which one we're going to have. Maybe it is impossible to build a large scale quantum computer, maybe it is. So I'd say we're sort of in a superposition of both future states of the universe. But paradoxically, uh, as a quantum researcher and other people working in this field, our goal is to actually measure that superposition and increase the probability so that one day we have a quantum future. Thank you. Thank you so much for the talk, Jessica. That was really good. Um, yeah, you managed to fit so much in about quantum computing. And someone has even said in the chat that it's the best talk they've ever attended online. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone watching enjoyed that. Um, Oh, thank you so much. So, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, I, I believe there's the Q and A. So a little bit, I have a little uh, 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 like prize thing. Um, I hope I hope this is okay. But um, I always I always like to get feedback. Oh, sorry. I always like to get feedback for my talks. Um, so basically, what I've done is if you go to this link, um, bit.ly forward slash Oxford dash talks dash feedback. Um, there's a little questionnaire and it just asks you questions, um, what you thought about the talk. And then I have this book called Quantum Computing for Everyone. And from all the responses I'll get, um, I'll do like a little lottery. So I'll just randomly, um, you know, select a number. Uh, and then I will send you this book if you live in the UK. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you go to this link and maybe if it's okay, we could give, because I, I think this talk was supposed to be an hour. So I, I did leave some time at the end for this. So uh, maybe if you guys can spend like five minutes uh, just to fill in the feedback and then um, and then I will, and then at the end, when you complete the questionnaire, so it's like so hard. When you complete the questionnaire, there's, um, it will give you the link to enter your name. And then I'll go through those, those lists of names and then I'll, I'll randomly, uh, I'll like generate a random generate number. And then I'll just select um, randomly someone from the list to get this book. Brilliant, yeah, um, please. Yeah, uh, great. So yeah, I guess we, we can't really hear the audience. Um, but yeah, I guess for just like the next five minutes uh, until 7pm. And then after that, we can do do Q&A. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we can give everyone a few minutes to go and give their feedback. Yeah, thank you so much.
And um, yeah, while we have those few minutes, if anyone wants to put questions in the Q&A section or in the chat, then we can start the questions in a few minutes. So yeah, just pop them in the Q&A or the chat and we'll discuss them in a bit. I've also just popped the link to the form in the chat if that's helpful for anyone. Yeah, great. Thank you. You're thinking the same thing I was. And, um, I'll just let everyone know while we wait the last couple of minutes. Um, next week, we've got an event with a quantum computing startup, um, River Lane. So if anyone's been inspired now to find out more about how to do quantum computing in industry, then do come along with that. Um, yeah, they're a very cool company. And I did an internship with them over the summer and they were really nice. So I would definitely recommend going along to that.
Um, I can answer questions. Maybe I, I see the responses are still kind of rolling in, so I don't want people to to rush it. So maybe um, maybe I'll actually like uh, do it after the Q and A or um, yeah the 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 drawing of the prize. So yeah, <laughs> I can answer questions. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, I think a good one to start with. But I think. Um... Three people have asked, uh, Alice, Philip, and an anonymous attendee is what your research topic is for your PhD. And um, yeah, it'd be great if you could tell us more about which group you're working with at, at Oxford and what you're working on. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so what I'm working on is um, basically, so I, I talked about quantum algorithms. So yeah, I'm taught. I'm basically working on quantum algorithms. Um, and in particular, there's a new type of quantum algorithm. Well, I would say like a new framework for quantum algorithms uh, called uh, variational quantum algorithms. There's actually multiple names kind of for similar things or hybrid quantum classical algorithms or even quantum neural networks. So basically, uh, these are quantum algorithms where you can actually run them on existing devices today. and they uh, kind of use this, it, it's sort of similar to a neural network, but um, different in that you kind of have this cost function and then you want to minimize or maximize it. And you have these parameters. So if we go back to the quantum gates, uh, I, I showed like, for example, the Hadamard gate. Well, actually you can create any gate you want, right? Because the gate is a matrix. So you can actually put in um, different like um, parameters in, in, in this matrix or in these gates. Um, and these variational quantum algorithms, what they do is you kind of adjust these parameters to optimize some cost function. So yeah, that was like more of a detail about like these types of quantum algorithms, but that's what I'm working on and, and trying to apply these to different um, applications. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so Another question we have is um, someone's given us a quote from Sabine Hosmerfelder, which says, I'm presently quite worried that quantum computing will go the same way as nuclear fusion, that it will remain forever promising, but never quite work. Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yes, I do. I'd say, uh, first of all, we have, uh, I think the reason why it's so exciting that we you know, have built this quantum computer and the quantum supremacy experiment is that we do have quantum computers that work. Um, though I should give a big caveat is that they are, they're not the best. Um, there's a lot of like errors. Um, we call this noise. So they're very noisy. Um, so the thing is, we know it works at least, you know, for 53 qubits or maybe a hundred qubits. I mean, there is a big question is, can we scale this? Can we get to thousands of qubits or millions of qubits? Will some, you know, will there be some new like physics law that, you know, prohibits this from happening? Um, and, you know, if that happens, that would also be pretty amazing, right? Is if we like discover like, oh, wow, there's actually some new like physics law that prohibits us from like scaling this up. So it, so I'd say the first thing is it does work at the small, small scale at the quantum computers we have today. Um, in fact, they're called Niski quantum computers, like Risky, Niski, uh, N-I-S-K-Q, uh, sorry, which stands for noisy intermediate scale quantum. Um, but the big question is, can we scale that up to a large scale quantum computer? That isn't really known, but um, it looks like it's possible. And if it's not possible, we'll discover something else interesting along the way, I'm sure. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks. Um, so another question we have is, if current quantum computers rely on assembling a series of gates to form an algorithm, does that mean that at the moment they can only do one function? Or have we already got to the stage of getting in effect a set of gates that function as a legitimately programmable CPU? Um, so, uh... I, I'm not sure what they mean by like one function is that you can, it's, it's pretty customizable as I mentioned is that you can, you can use different quantum gates um, and you can even have quantum gates with parameters to, uh, to do this. And I would say there's, there's sort of like, yeah, a set of quantum gates, for example, the variational quantum algorithms I mentioned, you can think of that as a set of quantum gates. Um, 
it's it's actually called i mean the specific terminology is called the ansatz uh, so that's sort of how do you arrange the the gates to do this variational quantum algorithm and you can actually uh think of that as like a, a, a module or a block or whatever and there are uh, there are uh, quantum machine learning apis where you can actually connect that with classical um like classical neural networks so you can have this like block of a you know, like a, a quantum circuit and actually connect that with classical uh, neural networks. And you can actually like uh, create like an architecture of different blocks of stuff like that. So, but I would say it, um, there's still like, uh, it's still, there's still opportunities to kind of um, abstract away the gates. I would say when you do quantum computing, it's very at the low level, right? It's at the level of these quantum gates um, and it would be really cool to sort of abstract that away such that you don't need knowledge particular of the quantum gates, you know, that you can like have these like programs that are, are abstracted away. But um, I think that is, uh, that is definitely an open problem. So. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, another question we have from Mukesh is, would it be possible that in future we all connect to quantum computers through our classical computers? maybe like a time sharing system of 1980s. Oh yeah, so some people have suge suggested this. So um, people do call it a QPU. Um, so, and that the idea is like, maybe we would have a QPU like alongside, you know, like a GPU or CPU. Um, so that's definitely possible. And there are, there are people who think that, you know, a quantum computer won't actually just like be by itself. It will be um, used with a classical computer. Um, and in fact, that's what we're doing today, right? Is with what I said, like the hybrid quantum classical algorithms. These are essentially using the classical and quantum computers together. So um, yeah, it, that's a good like thought is actually using them both together. Great. Um, and another question from George Paltos is, to be able to work on quantum computing is a physics degree a must or could you advance from computer engineering oh um i would say um uh you, yeah you don't you don't really need a physics degree um i would say obviously a physics degree uh well not even a physics degree but like knowing quantum physics helps uh to like understand um more of what's going on but you know, still, it's pretty like there's still a lot of things that aren't easy to understand. So, um, yeah, I would, I would, I'd say the cool thing about quantum computing right now is that because you have like these APIs, like the IBM Q experience, um, you, you can just like code it in Python. If you kind of understand how the logic works and which I sort of showed briefly today with the quantum gates, you can essentially program a quantum computer without needing to know all of the, the physics behind it. So yeah, I would say that it, it's, um, it's possible, yeah. Brilliant. Um, someone else has asked, what's the difference between a quantum computer and a quantum annealer? Yeah, so that is um, a good question. So basically, <clears throat> uh, the qubits are, are different. So uh, yeah, I, I should actually know when I'm talking about qubits in my talk, I am talking about the like the gate model of quantum computing um, and not so much quantum anne annealing. So quantum annealing, um, so for example, there's a company called D-Wave that works on this and they actually claim they have like thousands of qubits. So that does throw pe some people off and like, oh, we have 53 qubits there. Well, what about this? So the, their qubits are different and quantum annealing is more of, um, it's more, uh, it, it works differently than the gate-based model I, I mentioned. So it, it's more like for optimization types of problems. Um, and yeah, if you wanna know more about it, I recommend uh, going to D-Wave. They already, they also have their own API. I don't know if it's open like for free, but you can actually play around with that. So um, it's, it's more based on optimization problems. Great, thanks. Um, can I just, Jack, are you okay for a few more questions or? Oh yeah, so I, I, I think you said uh, until 7.15, 15 minutes. Um, yeah, and then at 7.15, I'll, I'll, I'll do the name thing, mm -hmm. the, the prize for the book. So. Yeah. Great, um, well, we've got one that's, are you at Stanford or Oxford? Oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> that's a bit confusing. Um, I'm at Oxford at the moment. 
so I'm in my dorm room <laughs> with uh, this weird setup, which, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's a very, very cool setup to have in your room. <laughs> um, and another question, do interpretations of quantum mechanics make any difference to the practical applications in quantum computing? <laughs> That's a good question. So, um, not not really. I mean, like you you still like as you saw, like the the gates are the same. Like like it it works as as I showed. Um, I mean, the interpretations is like well, what is happening? For example, when we measure the qubit, is there like another universe where it you know <laughs> is is in a different um, if in a different state? Uh, as long as we know in this universe, like it's in it's in the state that we measure. So um, yeah, <laughs> those are more like philosophical questions, I feel, um, but yeah. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, just to pitch in, if, if there's some limit to how big a superposition we can make or something, that there might be some, some limit to how universal a quantum computer could be. But yeah, um, quite a philosophical question, but yeah, it could have an impact. Um, the next question, what are the prerequisites for learning quantum computing? Um, I'd say it depends how deep you want to get involved into it. I'd say if you want to understand the maths behind it, that's probably, I would say learning the maths of quantum computing kind of makes the most sense in terms of like, it's more understandable, right? In terms of thinking of like these abstract things that are like collapsing or not, because when you do the maths, it just like, you know, logically follows, you know, you multiply this gate, this matrix by this. So if uh, like linear algebra and knowing matrices and vectors, but you, you don't even need to know that much. You just literally need to know how to like multiply the, the matrices and vectors. Um, I would say that's linear algebra is probably like w one of the main ones. Um, and I, yeah, and I would say, you, 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 I don't think you need that much uh, to get involved. Obviously, it depends on how deep you want to get into it. If you, if you want to have an understanding of the physics behind it, you can do quantum physics, but I don't think it's actually necessary. Um, I mean, also programming could be useful if, if you want to actually program it. So like learning Python, for example. But um, yeah, there, there's not too much if you want to just like play around with it. Great. Um, we have a question from... Jin Zhao Wang, um, he said, nice talk. Question, many people say that quantum computers can solve certain questions quicker than transistor computers, but I think it's unfair to compare a problem with another without mentioning the algorithm coupled to it. Which time complexity do these questions slash algorithms belong to when the quantum computer is more advantageous? Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So actually, if you're looking at um, computational complexity, Quantum uh, quantum computers have their own uh, their, their own classes of computational complexity. So there's different um, classes like BQP or, uh, and other ones like that. So uh, they are actually s separate in the sense that we have our own like quantum complexity and, and the classical uh, complexity. But th there is like a lot of open questions about how these two overlap, right? So like, you know, can we? Can we solve NP hard problems with a quantum computer and, and like all of these other uh, uh, other questions? And there's a lot of, you know, I mean, even in classical complexity, there's open questions on P equals NP. So that there are there are um, open questions on like how do these two overlap in terms of complexity? But um, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. So I don't know if that <laughs> answers the question. Great, thanks. Um, um, a question from Makesh Tekwani is, could you suggest one or two good books on an introduction to quantum computing programming with Python? Uh, yes. So, um, oh, I should say one is, if you want to get deep into quantum computing, there is a book um, by Isaac Schwang and Michael Nielsen. It's called Quantum Computation and Quantum Information. People call it Mike and Ike in the quantum computing community. Uh, it's like, you know, I used it from, I, I had it for my introduction to quantum computing course in, in college. So um, that's more in depth on like the maths and uh, all of that stuff. If you want to go into programming, um, there is a book called Quantum Computing uh, uh, and Applied Approach by Jack Hittery who is leading the quantum lab at Google uh, X um, in Palo Alto. Um, there 
is there's also other books like quantum uh, programming quantum computers dancing with qubits there's been a bunch of books that have come out um more on on that side i would say probably one of the most useful resources is actually ibm q experience because they have like this whole interface where you can actually drag and drop gates and play around with it and i do think they have like a, a textbook associated with it so um and they like show you directly the code so you could um if you like create an account they have a bunch of tutorials so i'd recommend that um i think it's 7 15 so i think we uh we can stop now. Um, so yes, I said I was going to do the random lottery thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate a random number and then I'm going to select uh, whoever's uh, number that is on the responses form. So random number and then I'll just say your name uh, and hopefully the person's still here. Okay, so it was two, uh, which is James Cummins. Did I say that right? I don't know if, if he's here. Oh, I guess they can't even speak. <laughs> um, I'll probably just find him. Oh, he is still here in the list of attendees. Okay, great. So if you could actually private message me your email and then I'll send you an email um, so that I can arrange to get the book to you uh, in the chat. Um, or I could probably, if you're at Oxford, I could probably find your email on the directory. Uh, but I'm sure they'll have, or you can contact me actually at contact at jessicapointing.com. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I think that's it, right? <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Um, yeah, that was really, really fun talk. Uh, thanks for coming again and answering all those questions. We've had such a huge amount of questions today. Um, yeah, I hope you good luck with your PhD and I hope to see you at the future events we have. Um, and do let us know if you have any ideas for events whether you started quantum computing <laughs> societies um, in Stanford and Harvard as well, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, bye. <laughs> bye.